Good morning and welcome as we gather in the safety and shelter of God's love and this sanctuary. Before we begin and go too far, I would invite you to please check your cell phones to make sure that they are on silent or turned off, please. And as we gather here in this time and place, um, you will notice a single candle on the altar by the Bible. That candle was, uh, is there in honor of uh, Edith's son-in-law, Roger Thurette, uh, who is married to Susan. And uh, they are unable to be here because uh, Roger was diagnosed with a terminal illness and family received word thus far that Roger has passed away. So as we gather here, uh, please be mindful of family who is not here and uh, remember them also in their time of loss. It's one big circle of family. And so we share in that together as well. I would invite you now to uh, turn your attention to the screens or turn to the hymnal to Selection 661 and join with me in the responsive call to worship. We gather as pilgrims on a journey of faith. We come seeking. Shine in our hearts, O God, with the light of your love. Make your presence known through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. Loving God, we gather as ones on a pilgrim path of life and faith. And we pause today to remember and honor the life of Edith Jewell Howard Funk, who has now stepped off that path and joined the greater cloud of witnesses who have gone before. She is also joined by her son-in-law, Roger, and we hold that family in prayer as well. The life and person of Edith Funk a life you have given and shared with us is a life and person for whom we give you great thanks. We pray that you be present with Jane, Susan, Melvin, and families, and all who are in the midst of loss and grief, even as we hold fast to a deeper, faith-filled sense of joy in the promise that you recreate life anew a life of which Edith now fully knows and experiences firsthand. Receive Edith into full fellowship through the covenant of faith and by the grace of your love for her. Draw near to us in this time of worship, this time of remembering, this time of honoring the gift of Edith's life to us. May our faith be strengthened and our hope renewed, even as we struggle with matters and realities of life that include death, that leaves a space of emptiness within our lives. Grant to us comfort and a clear and certain assurance of your love as we move forward through this day and the days to come. We thank you, God, for Edith's life and living and seek your presence in this place of worship as the gathered community of faith. We pray this in the name of the resurrected life of Jesus Christ, amen. I would also invite you now to please join in singing together. Words will be on the screen, when peace like a river.
I will be reading Psalm 121 this morning. And as you hear these words, I hope that you will keep Edith in mind. Edith often turned to scripture for support and strength and courage in the living of her days. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. with God from this day on his helping hand I'll lean upon this is my prayer my humble plea may the Lord be ever with me there is no day go dim there is no fear when I'm winner to him I'll lean on him forever and he'll forsake me never he will not fail me as long as my faith is strong whoever wrote I will walk along I'll walk with God I'll take his hand I will talk with God he'll understand I'll pray to him each day Never walk alone while I walk with God. Thank you, Doris, and thank you, Ellen. I picture Edith taking a lot of walks with God. I want to read now from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. May God bless the reading and the hearing of these words. We come now to a time of family sharing, and uh, I would like to invite Jim to come forward and uh, begin that time of sharing, and uh, there are others, and they may come up following Jim. I loved Grammy Funk. In fact, I loved her so much that Kim and I actually sat down and we made an arrangement. As long as a woman is 90 years old or older, I have full permission to flirt with her. <laughs> I know, I know, that sounds deranged and maybe a bit strange, but I could not hold myself back from flirting with Grammy by making her smile or laugh on every occasion that I possibly could. For instance, when Grandpa Funk was alive, I needed to be careful with my flirting. And I needed to get the colonel on my side. So I would simply get Grammy's attention and say, hey, Grandpa and I are hungry. Of course, insisting in a strange way. So Grammy would say, oh, oh, oh okay, well, what do you want? And I would look at Colonel, and we'd both catch eyes and say, we want hot fudge sundaes. <laughs> and she would always laugh, always, with her mischievous, beautiful grin. So many years later, after Grandpa had passed, conversations were usually over the phone, as I live in Chicago, and she obviously lived all over, but especially in Kansas. So I'd say, so, when are you going to move to up here to Golden Years in Wisconsin? And often she didn't know how to answer because, as you know, living was a very important subject for her. She didn't want to disappoint. And so she said, uh, I'm not sure. And so I said, well, there's been a petition. It's been signed by many a man. As a matter of fact, there's a whole line of 90-plus-year-old men up here that are looking for a beautiful May Queen to move into town. My wife would look at me as you probably are looking at me, but Grammy would actually laugh. Miracle. She would actually laugh at almost any joke that I made. So later in life, uh, when Grammy's mind started to be what I thought to be exceptionally sharp for her age, but sometimes she'd have a couple hiccups. I remember one time when she was up at uh, Jane, her daughter's house, and uh, Bob, her son-in-law's house, and she thought she saw something in her bowl of cereal. Well, we all knew that there was nothing really in that bowl of cereal but, but cereal, but she thought she saw insects, and so I leaned across the scripture as if to be mad and jealous. I said, I'm so jealous. Your bugs are bigger than mine. <laughs> and even in her foggy mind, in her confused mind, I just snuggled up to her and hugged her, and we'd share that bond again. She'd always laugh, always make me feel like I was the funniest guy on the planet. Grammy was a true blessing to me, to my wife, Kimmy, and to our entire family. She played baseball with us even into her 90s. She was always up for watching the kids' dances. She was always up for watching the kids play sports. But the best times were found when this game actually came along, one that confused her a bit, the Xbox 360. <laughs> she had no idea how that Xbox 360 could detect her movement of her arms, and she was absolutely amazed by this game. And so when the kids showed her that she could actually bowl, whether it was snowy out or rainy out, she fell in love with it. 
She actually got so good at it that she actually bowled a strike and then another and then finally that third, her first turkey. <laughs> so of course that became her new name for me or at least I convinced her that that was her new name for me, her very favorite turkey. <laughs> as you can tell, my humor is a bit dry. It might need even some updating, but Grammy didn't care. She always seemed to find an opportunity to smile or even to laugh. And that's how I remember her husband, Grandpa Funk, the Colonel, always looking for a reason to smile, always looking for an excuse to brag about his big belly, or even to turn those three words into humor anywhere he went. Anyone know it? Hot fudge Sunday. But then Grandpa died. I remember my wife and I actually shedding a tear, grieving his loss. We'd actually named our youngest son, his middle name Glenn, to remember Colonel's courage, his bravery, and also his sense of humor. And so today, we grieve Grammy's passing. We think of her endless travels, literally from one side of the earth to the next. And now I'm refreshed to know that Edith has her ticket for her very last voyage to her ultimate destination, where God himself is that scripture you just read. God himself will greet her and her beloved travel buddy, Colonel Flipper Funk. And so with this, she actually asked if I would read this, this poem. When she was alive, she picked it, and I just find it so appropriate as she has reached her final destination. It's called Footprints in the, Stand, in the Sand. The poem reads this way. Last night I had a dream. I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to me, the other belonged to the Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times of my life, there were only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said, once I decided to follow you you'd, you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, Lord, you would leave me. But the Lord replied, my son, my precious, my precious child, I love you and would never leave you. During your times of suffering, when you could see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Shane gave me a signal like, it's your turn, man. <laughs> the time before I called her, I was checking on her, and because the last time I saw her was at the Hutchison Hospital, and I thought, she doesn't have much longer in this world. But didn't hear anything about it for a while, so I called her, and uh, she answered on the third ring, and I said, Hi, Aunt Edith. She said, Delvin, you'll never guess what I'm holding in my hand right now. I said, what's that? It's the, probably the comic letter that you send me every so often. I thought, what are the odds that I would call her just as she had that? And her voice was clear. I thought, she's going to live forever. Uh, but then the last time I called, Something told me, it's time to check on Aunt Edith again. And uh, Jane answered the phone. I thought, hmm, this isn't good. And she said that 
and it was in bad shape and probably wouldn't last 24 hours maybe. I thought, hmm. I said, well, can I talk to her? And she said, well, she, she's got a lot of congestion, and so she won't be able to say anything to you. I said, that's okay, I'll just bend her ear a little bit. And she said, Jane said, well, there's two nurses in here right now. I said, well, let me know when, when I can talk to her. And uh, she said, okay. So about three minutes later, I thought it'd be maybe half an hour or so. I don't know how long nurses stick around, but she told me that uh, Anita could talk to me, or I could talk to her, I guess. So she put the, uh, I guess it turned out to be Melvin, put the phone to her ear. Is that right? Any, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, because I, my goal was to make her laugh. And I said, hi, Anita, this is Delvin. She said, yeah, mm -hmm, yep. And I said, uh, hey, I've got another birthday or another comic letter to send you. I'm getting ready to, to mail it. And uh, also, you're going to be 97 on March the 10th, so I need to start writing that poem for you. And she, she said, OK. And then I'm still trying to make her laugh. And I said, I figured maybe Jane was holding the phone. And I said, don't let that Jane boss you around, OK? And she chuckled a little bit. And I said, yes, I've got it. <laughs> and so then uh, I said, OK, well, I'm going to uh, let you get back to snoozing now. But I'm looking forward to the next time I see you. And she said, uh, thank you, Delvin. Well, I said, so long for now. Yeah, that's what I said. And she said, thank you, Delvin. So Jane got on the phone and said, did you hear what she said? I said, yeah, I heard her. So uh, I told Marcy, I said, you know what? With my call to her, she's going to last more than 24 hours. She's going to last two or three days now. And Marcia said, it's all about you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I conked out a poem for her. My Aunt Edith. Uncle G, 96 plus 6, did not live long as mate. Three 15 days past 96. Aunt Edith, you did great. I felt quite close to dear Aunt E. I liked her more than most. Photogenic, yes siree. And like me, wouldn't boast. She always knew my voice on phone and told me I was clever. With Howie gone, she lived alone, forgetting that dog never. Which doesn't mean she didn't miss her husband, Uncle G. I'm not sure how he got a kiss, and like her main man, whee! <laughs> Annie lived beyond main man love, just shy of five whole years. And talking about him up above would sometimes bring on tears. One time I found out something cool about this aunt of mine. She counted things, this Aunt E. Jewel. I thought to myself, how fine. This scene took place at mom's house once, squashing pop cans right and left. I told her number we had done. She said, that's just what I got, yes. That brought her closer to me, though 18 years apart, to be as kind, thoughtful as she, I couldn't even start. Another time to have some fun, I asked my Uncle G, when everything is said and done, do you rate, do you rate less than Howie? He said, it depends on the day. <laughs> she doesn't feed me yet. I'd ask her now, but she would say, that's anybody's guess. I called Aunt Edith before she passed, she still knew it was me. My goal was just to make her laugh. Favorite nephew line 
was key. Thanks for liking me, Annie. We thank the church for their support and being able to live stream so that Susie and her family can celebrate our, and honor Edith with us and know that we mourn your loss of Roger. On behalf of Susie, Tasha, and Tiffany, they send a text. We are so sorry we can't be there to celebrate sweet mom and Grammy's life today with all of you. We love her so much and will miss her. Roger is celebrating with Grammy, now in heaven, along with Glenda and Glenn and all their other relatives that have gone before and friends. <clears throat> Today we celebrate the life of Edith Jewell Howard Funk. She liked her whole name that way. She was proud of being a Howard. She was proud of being a Funk. When she was crowned homecoming queen in 1940, she was asked to say a few words to her classmates unexpectedly. She related that all she could say and do was wave and say, thanks a lot, folks. <laughs> so we'd like to say thanks a lot, folks, for coming today to honor Edith and the legacy that she leaves behind. Mom lost her dog, Howie, in May 2018, and she seemed to feel that then she had no purpose being here on earth. We tried to remind her that part of her purpose was bringing joy, joy to her family of 45 and joy to the residents who lived with her. And she did that. The family has received many, many comments stating exactly that. They will miss the joy that Edith brought and her smile. I would like to read this tribute from two of her 18 grandchildren. And this was sent when, uh, when I was there this last week. I love you to the moon and back. You have been such a huge influence on my life, how you seem to win at every game we play, for how you bring joy and wonder to any situation, how you have made and kept friendships for more than eight decades for how you make people feel so special, beautiful, and loved, for how you loved and supported your husband, and most importantly, your faith and trust in Jesus. You are a beautiful woman inside and out. Thank you for being my cheerleader, my confidant, my arm scratcher, my shopping buddy, and my grandma. I couldn't ask for a better one. I love you and from another grandchild. I love the joy you spread whenever you walk into a room. I love the way you play games and find enjoyment in the little things. I love how you sacrifice so much of your life supporting your husband with the Air Force and protection of our country. I love your laugh. It is so sweet and tender. I love how you say my name and oh fiddle. <laughs> I love your adventurous spirit to travel to so many places. And I'll just break real quick. If you saw the little cross stitch down in her, uh, by, beside her, her mother had made that. And she always, she said when she came here, I want to come home. I want to come home back to McPherson. Well, now she's home, and that's her 59th move on, of hers. So... I love how you love Jesus and would always read your Bible each night. I love your long fingers and strong fingernails. I love how you hosted Christmas and bingo, which provided a place for all the families to get together and make memories. I love how you listen. You have a special way of making people feel comfortable around you. I love how you tell stories and relive your life through sharing those memories. I love your faithfulness to your husband, and I love how you see a need and want to fill it with your generosity. I love your beautiful face and bright smile. I love that you have used your life to care and love the people around you. 
You have built a legacy of others believing in Christ and his greatest commandment, which is to love God with all your heart and love your neighbors as yourself. You have done that so well. God looks down and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Your life has been fruitful, and you have loved, sacrificed, and spread joy throughout it. Thank you for being a wonderful example to so many of how it is to be a joy-filled, faithful, and loving woman. We all love you. Jane asked me to read something that had belonged to her mom, and I will, but I want to tell you first, I think I knew her other than Delvin and the Funks. I knew her about as long as anybody. I knew her before she and Uncle Glenn got married, and I don't remember it because I was a baby then, <laughs> but uh, she was always a wonderful part of our lives, and uh, Aunt Edith was a military wife for 32 years. I had the, that privilege for 30 years. She was my inspiration and my role model. She and Uncle Glenn taught us how to use our faith in our military life and how we could become better people in the world and help the world to be a better place. She wasn't just an inspiration to me. She inspired hundreds of probably thousands of military women, wives, spouses, throughout the world. Everyone looked up to her as a, as a role model because she taught everyone how to have dignity and love and, and, um, and also be able to handle everything and to be so supportive of everyone. So this is a tribute to her, and it's an honor to be able to be asked to read it. I hope I do it justice, Jane. <laughs> this is the Military Wife. The good Lord was creating a model for military wives, and when his, it was in his sixth day of overtime, when an angel appears, she said, Lord, you seem to be having a lot of trouble with this one. What's wrong with the standard model? The Lord replied, have you seen the specs on this order? She has to be completely independent, possess the qualities of both father and mother, be a perfect hostess to four or 40 within an hour's notice, run on black coffee, handle every emergency imaginable without a manual, must be able to carry on cheerfully even if she's pregnant and has the flu, and she must be willing to move to a new location 10 times in 17 years. And oh yes, she must have six pairs of hands. The angel shook her head, six pairs of hands, no way. The Lord continued, don't worry, we will make other military wives to help her, and we will give her uh, an, an unusually strong heart so that he can swell with pride in her husband's achievements, sustain the pain of separations, and be large enough to say, I understand when she doesn't, and to say, I love you regardless. Lord, said the angel, touching his arm gently, go to bed and get some rest. You can finish this tomorrow. I can't stop now, said the Lord. I'm so close to creating something unique. Already, this model heals herself when she's sick. She can put up six unexpected guests for the weekend, wave goodbye to her husband from a pier, a runway, or a depot, and understand why it's important that he leave. The angel circled the model of the military wife, looking at it closely and sighed, oh, it looks fine, but it's just too soft. She might look soft, replied the Lord, but she has the strength of a lion. You would not believe what she can endure. Finally, the angel bent over and ran her finger across the cheek of the Lord's creation. Uh-oh, there's a leak, she announced. Something is wrong with the construction. 
I'm not surprised it cracked. You're put, trying to put too much into this model. The Lord appeared offended at the angel's lack of confidence. What you see is not a leak, he said. It's a tear. A tear? What's it there for, asked the angel. The Lord replied, it's for joy, for sadness, pain, disappointment, loneliness, pride, and a dedication to all the values that she and her husband hold dear. You're a genius, exclaimed the angel. The Lord looked puzzled and replied, I didn't put it there. That's it. very short. Uh, the last time I saw Aunt Edith, I told her that she was the sweetest, nicest lady I've ever met in my life. And I meant it. And of course, she smiled and said thank you and uh, always had a smile on her face. But I also told her if there were, if there were more people like her in this world, what a beautiful place to live it would be. And uh, before today, I didn't know her middle name. And uh, when I heard Jewel was her middle name, I thought how appropriate because of the Jewel that she was. I just wanted to get up and uh, provide a little comic relief and remind everyone about Parp Tots in East Clintwood. <laughs> if you don't know, it's Pop Tarts, she would call them Parp Tots, kind of like calling Zira Kinza and Kinza Zira confusing stuff. And East Clintwood was one of my all time favorites. At this time, the family is going to lead us in a song in the sweet by and by, and the words will be on the screen as well. So we invite you to join in singing as they lead us in this. Do you want to go over here? That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm Edith's gr oldest granddaughter, Jane's daughter. Um, and we're going to sing this in honor of my grandmother, who her mother used to sing this a lot to her, and it was one of her favorite songs. But we really want you to join in because we don't want to offend Grammy <laughs> with our singing. So please join us as we do. <laughs>
Well, thank you, family, for carrying that. Um, we had a little technical difficulty with words on the screen, but I'm glad you were here to sing and share that with us. Thank you so much. I first learned to know Edith and Glenn when my family moved west to Denver, Colorado from Virginia in 1973. My dad took the pastorate at the Prince of Peace Church of the Brethren, where Edith and Glenn were members at that time. And I remember then, as I do now, both Edith's and Glenn's broad and beautiful smiles. Glenn's sense of humor and Edith's quickness with her smile. And then over time and the natural progressions to life and growing older, we parted ways. I went on to live my life and they went on to live theirs, only to meet again here in McPherson when they came back to the Cedars, as Edith and Glenn chose to, in a sense, come home, to enjoy more of retirement with less responsibility of being homeowners and to be in a caring community. By the time I first met Edith and Glenn in Denver, a lifetime of growing, learning, education, marriage, raising a family, work, and numerous moves within the states and abroad had unfolded. I had no idea at that time what preceded in their lives before coming to Denver. But being an Air Force wife, Edith moved 58 times, and we can add one more, 59. Four of those times were before marrying Glenn and the rest after to accommodate the many transfers and trainings Glenn underwent for his service to the country as a pilot, as a flyboy. As a child, there were several moves to accommodate being closer to family, moves related to work, and tragically, while in her senior year of high school, the untimely deaths of her parents which placed Edith in the care of different family members until marrying Glenn at the age of 18. And there were many upon many challenging times ahead for Edith as she embarked on her life with Glenn. But Edith so much relied on her faith. She turned to her faith, she turned to scripture, she turned to worship. The many moves notwithstanding Edith would have bouts of loneliness with Glenn away so frequently while in the service of his country. Edith had their first child, Glenda, under the care and support of relatives here in Kansas while Glenn was away at McCook Army Air Base in Nebraska. It was hard on Glenn as well to be away when his bride was giving birth. As Glenn's training progressed and he received his pilot's wings, moves stateside and abroad became ever more frequent. After flying 16 missions in his B-24 airplane, Glenn was shot down during the D-Day invasion. Glenn was declared missing in action and then later a prisoner of war. I can't imagine what it must have been like for Edith to receive news such as this, to be raising a child in the midst of uncertainty. I imagine Edith being under a great deal of anxiety with this news, as you might well imagine. But that same year, Glenn was liberated and able to return to the States and to his family. And it was after this experience that Glenn decided to leave the Air Force, but he remained in the active reserves. And that only lasted for a brief time, maybe two years or so. And Glenn was ready to get back to it. He was ready again to serve more fully and become active for a second time in the service. I wonder what that was like for Edith as well to maybe think that she had her husband full time with her and then for Glenn to re-up again. 
During this time of active service, another child, Jane, was born. Glenn's return to active duty took Edith and family, this time, to Japan. And while in Japan, preg pregnant with their third child, Susan, Susan was born after a 10-hour train ride to the nearest Army hospital where Edith and Susan were placed in a room with 25 other mothers and newborns. I think we can safely say that nobody got any meaningful sleep or rest. Following the return stateside from Japan, Melvin, Edith's and Glenn's fourth child was born in Clovis, New Mexico. More moves ensued, abroad and again back to the States. Finally, Edith's and Glenn's lives began to settle into something a little more permanent, but still a little bit tenuous. Thus far, the span of time covered in this quick life tour begins with the early 1940s through to the late 60s, early 70s, closer now to when I met Edith and Glenn in Denver. There is so much detail and so much of life lived that has been left out and unmentioned. But the point I want to make is that Edith was just as much of service to this country as Glenn. We've already heard uh, something about uh, the life of a military family, the life of a military wife. Edith and her family, immediate and extended, are all a part of what it means and what it takes to support those who choose to serve in the armed forces. Rearing a family, multiple moves and transitions was very much a nomadic kind of life. No small task as a young married couple, as a young mother, and no small task while trying to raise a family. This nomadic life may not be as enticing or romantic as it might appear. Yet Edith and family made it work with perseverance and love. Edith's life, to be sure, was filled with adventure. It was filled with discovery, travel, responsibilities, joys, enrichment, and accomplishment. Yet in the mix of all that, there were moments of loneliness, challenge, stressful uncertainty in being the wife of a career serviceman. As we know, Edith is but one of so many who has served as support for their loved one. And when I met Edith and Glenn in the early 1970s, their smiles were just as bright and welcome in the midst of such a challenging and fascinating life journey together. And from that point on, they continued sharing rich and meaningful times with you as family, with travel, with friends and adventure, until we met once again at the Cedars. I want to pause a moment with this forward timeline to turn back to Edith's earlier days here in McPherson. Edith was a bit of an historical celebrity back then. While living in McPherson and having completed grade school at Lincoln Elementary and junior high school, Edith became, by vote, the first McPherson High School homecoming queen her senior year. She was honored by being driven in a convertible around the perimeter of the football field, and then as they approached the middle of the field, they cut across the field where she was to deliver a speech for which she was not at all prepared. It was a surprise, and as Jane related, when they put the microphone in her face, and said, speak, all that came out was, thanks a lot, folks. So how do, how do you take that? Like, thanks a lot, folks, or thanks a lot, folks. <laughs> take your pick. That same year, she was also voted as Miss Personality. And it's no wonder Glenn took a shine to her. 
It was at this time, this same time, that Edith was working at the local Ritz Theater as an usher at when she met Glenn and romance launched with an older man, no less, a college student. And then many fond memories and family blossomed from those early beginnings. Another aspect of Edith's life was the development of two lifelong friends. Betty Moore and Helen Collins were mainstay relationships from her childhood. They were so close and they were always together that the three of them, Edith Howard, Helen Collins, Betty Moore, would become to known as the Hokomo girls after the first two letters of their last names. In these moments in Edith's life, when things were lonely, stressful, and hesitant, Edith's faith sustained her and carried her through times of loss, life transition, through times of deep uncertainty, and through tremendous amounts of change. Words from scripture often spoke to Edith of comfort and strength. One in particular was from Psalm 55, verses one through eight. And as you hear these words, place yourself in her shoes. Perhaps when she is receiving news of Glenn's plane going down, or perhaps another transfer in her life, or the loss of her parents. Psalm 55, one through eight. Give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and answer me. I am troubled in my complaint. I am distraught by the noise of the enemy because of the clamor of the wicked, for they bring trouble upon me, and in anger they cherish enmity against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and it be rest. Truly, I would flee far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hurry to find shelter for myself from the raging wind and tempest. And these words from Romans 14, speaking of belonging to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. When needed, and just as reminders, these texts and others brought comfort and hope to Edith. In this time of loss and letting go, and as we think of Roger, Susan, and family, may you as family find scripture that speaks to your need in life's moments of change, transition, loneliness, uncertainty, May you find scripture that gives you hope and sustains you in and through all as it did for Edith. Edith made an underline in one of her daily devotions. It read, perhaps prayer was not just expecting an immediate solution to my problem, but rather trusting God was working to bring good from our struggles. As we come into a time of prayer, may we approach with the same attitude of trust and patience as Edith, without immediate expectation, but patience and openness to God's leading, to God's answers, to God's wisdom and spirit.
We come now to a time of prayer. And at the end of this time together, <clears throat> I would invite us to say together the Lord's Prayer. And as we get to that sort of tricky little stumbly part, I would invite us to use the words debts and debtors. Please join with me in prayer. Eternal and loving God, in you we live and move and have our being. Whether we perceive your presence or not, you are never far from us, and you are most near when we feel deep hurts, loss and profound aloneness. Reveal yourself to us in this hour as the God who watches over all our ways and turns even death and sorrow into blessing for those who love you. In the midst of grief and with sadness of heart, we have gathered for these moments of faith, honoring and love. We have gathered to celebrate the life you have created in the person and spirit of Edith. Take from us the shadows that surround us and give us your light and wisdom to see the whole of life, to see and remember the complete person of Edith. Help us to know that you are the God of the living, that with you there are no dead, and that our loved one Edith is at home with you and in your care. Help us to confirm that death instead of ending life is the beginning of a larger and more abundant life in that land of promise, that land of milk and honey. We thank you, God, for the life of Edith. We thank you for the many places she lived and served that finally brought her here to us. We thank you, God, for the love, care, and wisdom she shared with her family for her service to country, community, and church. May your spirit of blessing and comfort be close to family and friends to offer strength and hope for a future without Edith's physical presence, but a future that holds Edith in heart and mind. As we miss her, O oh God, help us also to let her go to return to you as the one who created her and the one in whom we move to, to be joined together once again. In Christ's loving name, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to a close, I would invite you to raise your voices in song once again, and let us sing together, How Great Thou Art.
Edith has made her final move. May we rejoice and celebrate with her that she no longer has to move again, but that she has been rejoined and reunited with those who have gone before. Receive now this benediction. May God, whose breath gives life and being, bless you this day with comfort and peace. May God, whose Son brought salvation and life eternal, bless you this day with grace and newness of soul. May God, whose Spirit empowers with vision and understanding, bless you this day with courage and with wisdom. God bless you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>